remember this stuff. But you I do mean, remember oh, yes, it. I do remember it. What do you remember? I remember being, I was bound in gauze over my mouth and I couldn't understand why they wouldn't let me go out and play and I insisted that they let me go out and play and I couldn't understand how could it be dark and I'm awake and it's dark outside it was just like that kind of a memory. So this museum is dedicated to the community of Denora and particularly to that horrible event the 1948 smog. Well, let me ask you something. Your father, Charles Stacy, was in charge of the uh, public health. What, what, what did he do then? Well, he, was, he was in. I remember reading about. Well, some... they, they, there was a health board in Denora, and it was uh -huh. a, a civilian group by and large. It had one physician on it, and that was Dr. Bill Rongus. And my father in 1948 happened to be the president of the health board at the time. And when the smaller hit, of course, they heard all sorts of reports and did all sorts of investigations and so forth. And he was very upset by the fact that so many people in Denora were in denial. We in Denora were sort of used to things like that and we didn't think too much of it until we started to get the reports that people were being sent to the hospital and people were dying and Dr. Rongers was saying, get the hell out of town if you want to live. Thank you, Dr. Stacy, And thanks to all of you for coming out for this very special day. It is a day to commemorate those who passed on during this smog and those whose lives were shortened or made worse. And I thought I would title this talk, Was There Another Denora? Because when I first heard about the Denora Killer Smog, I uh, had gone off to Pitt and went to school, and I thought they must be talking about another town, because the place I grew up was wonderful. And I realized Denora was really unusual when I went to China for the United Nations Development Program. And we were supposed to be visiting this new green town. And uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I heard this huge explosion, boom, and saw fire and tar and smoke. And so I could smell this stuff. And I thought, I was really pretty excited. Now, my colleagues that I was with were embarrassed because they were Chinese scientists, and they knew that this was a sign of dirty development and pollution and not this great green thing we'd been promised. I was excited because it smelled like home. People came to Denora because smoke meant jobs. Smoke meant money. And sometimes they'd say, what's that smell? And my grandfather would say, that smells like money. I'm sure many of you have heard those expressions. But this picture, which I think might have been taken by Ansel Adams, is a stunning indication of the, of the prosperity of the town. And it was just assumed that this was the price of progress. If you wanted to progress, you had to have smoke. This was the mill in October of 1948, and people again were boasting of its progress and its prosperity. These are the hills opposite the zinc plant, and nothing grew there. Now, every once in a while, a casket would wash out of the ground. And people hadn't quite figured out that there was a connection between that, that smoke and what happened on the ground. The cemetery, uh, I gather it's not in very good shape right now. But it is certainly a, a testimony to what happened then, when you couldn't even get grass to grow on the graves of the dead. And this map is very interesting because if you study it, you see that all the deaths in Denora occurred within a half mile of the zinc plant. Now the question is, why did people die in Denora? This inversion hit the entire area. It was a large scale inversion. Throughout the Monongahela Valley, there were steel mills and rolling mills and coke ovens throughout the valley. Denora burned as much coal in a single day as the entire city of Pittsburgh, because it had an incredible concentration of mills. But why did the deaths happen in Denora? Philip Sattler reported an analysis he did of the air conditioning duct, a very interesting and creative thing to do. But he found a filter and analyzed it and found 1,000 parts per million of fluoride in it. And then there's even more compelling evidence. An autopsy was conducted on someone who had been exhumed, and their blood was found to contain levels of fluoride 10 to 25 times above normal, 
toxic levels of fluoride. Jared Diamond once said that tragic sins become moral failures if we should have known better in the first place. And there are many situations today in the world where we clearly should know better. We should know better than to subject children to working in factories with asbestos as they do now in India. We should know better than to build dirty coal-fired power plants now when we can do better with conservation of, of energy. Well, another interesting part of the puzzle I just recently discovered is that Helmut Schrenk, who led the Denora study for the Public Health Service, was a fluoride gas expert who had worked as a secret consultant on poison gas for the Manhattan Project atomic bomb program. That's the guy they sent in to study Denora. He was an expert on fluoride in, in the air. And Levels found that autopsy on one person were so high, they were clearly toxic. They were told to get the heat the heck out of town, the heat referring to what was left over from the zinc plant because they knew there was something wrong. They had been burning a different mixture. But to me, it certainly implicates the idea that they were doing perhaps a deliberate experiment, perhaps not a deliberate one. But somewhere along the line, there was something really unusual, because why did the deaths happen only in Denora? There's got to be an answer. And it's a question we need to have an answer to today because of what's happening in India and China now. What if, in fact, instead of denying that there was a problem, industry had worked with the unions to make more efficient factories? That is what we're going to have to do now. That is what the green revolution in jobs will be all about. We're not going to do without steel or energy, but we're going to have to figure out how to make it greener and safer. So we have to deal with the fact that we've been living under a circumstance where the burden of proof has been, show me the bodies. Show me the evidence that somebody's really been sick or harmed by pollution before we will act to prevent others from being harmed. That, I submit, is the wrong approach to take. Because that means you're experimenting on people. So instead, we have to rely on wildlife evidence and experimental studies to predict the possibility of harm, rather than waiting for proof that people have already been damaged. Clarence Mills wrote in Science Magazine that the Denora tragedy should prove to be an object lesson in air pollution, so that it would never happen again. It will awaken people everywhere to the dangers they face from pollution of the air. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And Denoras are happening today in small areas of India and China. And that is why the work of the Denora Smog Memorial and the Denora Smog Museum is so important. We can't go back and reclaim the lives of those that were taken or shortened by the pollution that marked our valley. But we can and we must warn those who are living under similar conditions today. And that's why I'm very, very grateful. And I think we should give a hand of applause to those who organize this museum and organize this activity. And I think at the interest, interest of time now, for, so we'll have a chance for a little bit of discussion, I'll conclude my presentation um, and look forward to talking to you further. Please look at the materials that we've left for you here. And be, we'll be happy to have you contact our website. Thank you.